On September 14, 1992, I was involved in an aircraft accident. I was working with National Park Service, along with another seasonal ranger, Patty, and the Park Service pilot, Bruce. And we were flying in a 185 Cessna on floats. And we're on a routine hunting patrol. I was a pilot and I had two observers on board with me. We uh, stopped at this lake. Uh, we've been flying for a couple hours to uh, get out and take a break. Before we landed on that lake, we were going to land on a certain lake prior to that, but there was ice on that lake. So what we did was we went a few more miles and picked this other lake, which is a pretty remote lake, pretty small lake almost, you know, the big pond. We had a real good landing. Um, it's a little bit breezy, maybe 15 mile an hour winds. And, but as soon as we landed and got out, there was already ice starting to form on the floats of the plane. We got back into the plane and, you know, it was still getting a little bit more icy. It was pretty cold out. It was, it was about 25 degrees and now the winds were picking up a little. And the wind uh, really picked up and became gusty and, and uh, turbulent. Like Stan said, everything, you know, things started to ice up. Um, that was a real concern of Bruce's. Bruce was scraping off the ice on the, on the window and he was checking the rudders and just making sure there was no ice. I sailed back to the south end of the lake here and uh, began my takeoff run. He started going across the water. The, the plane was taken off at, you know, rather normal. The left float got off of the water. Uh, the aircraft uh, rolled uh, gently to the right and it, it overturned. The wing hit the water, the whole plane just flipped forward. And then sitting in the front seat, I just, I saw the, you know, the water, what appeared the water coming up, but we were flipping over. I was, had my, had, had opened my door as soon as I felt that the airplane was going to overturn. Um, as it turned out, this was very advantageous to, to our survival. It expedited us getting out of the airplane. Um, and it just kind of rolled right over. And luckily, Bruce opened his door before we completely flipped over. As soon as we flipped over, I realized once I was upside down, hanging by my seatbelt, what had happened. And at that point, I still wasn't real worried about the situation. I knew what had happened, but I wasn't quite in a panic yet. And then almost immediately, the water started rushing in. And remember, I was upside down. The door wouldn't open. I, I couldn't push it open. Uh, I didn't think of opening the window. I didn't think of kicking the window out. Uh, the only thing I thought of was, OK, I know the door on the other side is open. I'll just go out that door. I started to panic a little bit because uh, I was underwater, and I knew the fuselage was full. And I didn't know what was really in my way. My first reaction when I got out of that plane was to swim to shore. Bruce grabbed me and he yanked me and he got me up onto the floats and he said, pull your, your life vest. I did not pull my life vest. Um, I wasn't thinking about that. The very beginning of that, that plane accident is really, um, it was real traumatic for me. I inflated Patty's jacket. My life jacket did not inflate. I had an inflatable uh, Stern's jacket on. And I didn't even think of inflating my jacket until he said that. I, it just didn't even strike me, even though I swam from the plane up. The wind chill was down around 15 to 20 below zero. And we were completely, completely wet at this point. I knew that if we stay, stayed on the floats, that due to our exposure, we'd be, we'd be dead. Uh, Probably, I don't know if we could have survived a couple hours on there. Bruce asked if all three of us were ready to, to swim. We would not make it if we stayed on those floats. You know, we would die of exposure, hypothermia. Um, and at that point, I was feeling like I'm not going to leave these floats. I'm going to stay on these floats and somebody, until somebody finds us. And um, 
I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't swim those 75 or 100 yards. And he finally talked me into swimming. We decided we were going to do this together. And I was, I was real scared at that point. No one knows we're here. It's not like we wrecked. We get to shore and someone <clears> comes and saves us. It's not going to be that easy. Just, it was hard to be decisive to even make a decision. You know, I could feel the hypothermia start to, start to come in. He and made that decision for us. I mean, oh, he, yeah. he took charge. He said, you know, we're either going to stay on these floats together and die together, which we don't want to do, or we're going we're to swim to shore. And that we decided to swim to shore together, and we were going to stay together. Bruce and I were pretty much swimming alongside each other, and Stan was somewhere behind us a little bit, but not too far. And I started realizing, uh, you know, I'm not doing too well. <laughs> so while I was floating on my back, just getting a little break, trying to, you know, breathe again from choking, my body felt totally numb, especially my arms and my legs, feet and hands especially. And then, uh, then all of a sudden, all the pain, you know, the pain of the water and the pain of the swimming, the pain of the stress was all going away. And it was a, it was a really light, feelings. It did. It just felt so easy. It's like, okay, this can all be over. It can be so easy. All I have to do here is just keep laying on my back and it's just like I'm going to fall asleep and it's going to be real easy and it's going to be over. It's, it wasn't really even scary at that time. I, I wasn't scared. I wasn't in pain. I wasn't even tired anymore. It was just, it was just relaxing. And then it, then it hit me that, you know, what I was thinking, because still I was hypothermic at the time and I could tell I was still thinking slow. And then it struck me that, that, hey, yeah, well, I'll be here and it'll be all over, but then I'll be dead. And then it got to the, that's when it struck me that the feelings, the, well, the feeling I was having was the feeling of death. I recall mid, about midway through uh, the swim to shore, I just started becoming numb, totally numb. My, I couldn't feel my arms anymore, my legs. Um, and I just, I started becoming lethargic. Um, I became, I got to the point where I could feel myself kind of, you know, my head started dropping and dropping and my eyes started closing a little bit. I was uh, drifting away. Um, and I started thinking to myself, this must be death. This is the start of death. And right before that, Right before I closed my, my eyes, I, I had visions. I had two visions. I had a vision of my mom at my funeral. And I had a, a vision of all three of us floating on that lake. And the people flying over, my friends flying over, and seeing us there, dead. And for some reason, those two visions made me come to life again, or just gave me a whole different perspective on a whole different strength. And, uh, <laughs> and from that point on, it was, it was all positive, we're going to do this. I started yelling, I remember, at Bruce, Bruce, we're going to make it, we're going to do it. And we kept, I kept yelling this, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. But I could hear Patty yelling, and uh, that also helped a lot and gave me the motivation to keep going because I I didn't know if they were there or not, or if I was going the right way, or, you know, but then when I heard them, it kept giving me the motivation to go, and, and basically the thought, well, hey, if they made it, I can make it too. Even though when we got to shore, we were uh, extremely hypothermic, uh, pretty much clubbed from the knees and, and elbows down, uh, I wasn't able to uh, stand the first couple times that I, that I tried to here on the shore. So Stan came into shore so shortly after uh, Patty and I got here, and, and uh, that was a, a tremendous relief to me just to know that we had all survived to shore. But at that point, we were, we were in a real uh, possible death situation because of our exposure. And because we're so remote here, um, the chance of being located quickly was, uh, was very difficult. And, we met together on shore and um, started following Bruce up. And Bruce came upon a, 
a real sheltered cut bank, dirt cut bank, um, off of the lake. Bruce found a good little sheltered area that would keep us out of the wind. What he, what Bruce started doing was gathering. He started gathering dried, dried moss and dried grass. But we couldn't. It's like we couldn't, we couldn't grab anything because our bodies, our hands were just shaking. We were just so cold. At that point, uh, my clothes were starting to freeze, and my hair was actually frozen. I can remember, my hair was frozen solid. Uh, Stan and I began gathering uh, dry willow, and the willow that was around, um, there wasn't a whole lot, but we got enough to at least start our, our fire. <clears throat> and we took out our matches, and our matches supposedly were waterproof matches. Um, the matches, I guess, were fine, but what we struck them on was saturated and with water, and that deteriorates it. So, you, you know, it was useless anyway. And luckily, Bruce had got, he had a um, magnesium <clears throat> see, striker. And then we got a little fire started. The fire itself was was very small. I mean, it was no bigger than about eight inches across. And um, it's amazing how little of a fire you can have to keep you going. And I, I really believe that that fire probably saved our lives. I, I, without the fire, I don't think that we would have, would have survived. It was a, just knowing that I had to keep this fire going in order to survive. Once we got that fire going, we realized, OK, we're going to live. We're going to make it. We told ourselves we're going to stay up all night. We're not going to go to sleep right now. That that concept, you know, honestly scared me. Spending the night there, just because, uh, you know, it was just a fear of the unknown. What's going to happen? Is it going to get colder? Is it going to snow? Uh, are we going to fall asleep and die? Or is the fire going to go out? We had this tiny little fire, and Stan and Bruce and I were just, you know, just honkered around it. We were trying to get the fronts of our bodies around the fire just to dry out, but we were mainly concerned with our hands and our feet. have never been as cold for a sustained period of time as I was that night, and, and we were all probably as miserable as we had, had ever been or may ever be. Just we constantly communicated, and that's what kept me going. I, I had no doubt in my mind that we were not going to make it. I knew we were. But the positive outlook was, was really good. That's what, that's what really kept us strong, kept us going, just us being together and us being positive together. It was just strong enough to keep us going. And uh, we knew that it was important to keep, keep a positive uh, frame of mind and really believe that, uh, that we were going to survive the situation. We stayed up all night talking and um, singing and just keeping each other going, you know, keeping each other warm, trying to, to keep a, a real good frame of mind about it. And, but we spoke a lot about trying to figure out the scenario of what they're thinking of in Kotzebue, what they're thinking of at headquarters. How are they going to rescue us? When are they going to figure out we're gone? Uh, how are they going to rescue us? How much time are they going to get? Are they going to find us? Bruce under, understood the way the plan usually goes in caught to view and, and how these searches usually usually progress. You know, the planes wouldn't come out at night, but they would, you know, probably come out in the morning. Bruce uh, didn't really seem to be fluctuating. He seemed to be, you know, just stuck in that uh, shiver stage. I think that I probably didn't regain my body heat quite as quickly as, as, the, as the other two people. It was just so cold. Well, he had the cotton socks, which were soaked, and his feet were just ice. So I tried to um, rub his feet, but they, they didn't seem to be getting very warm. Since his uh, core temperature seemed to stay low, and he wasn't really recovering, he stayed around the fire most of the night. Bruce would keep the fire going, because that was <laughs> very important. That, to us to always keep that fire going for any reason. Yeah, and I think that really helped out as far as his, you know, his um, morale. morale or whatever. And it would be 
probably at least into the next day before there were uh, there were search aircraft uh, possibly here to uh, to locate us. Out of plane. Then we started hearing planes in the distance. We could hear aircraft uh, searching to the west of us, and uh, we heard an aircraft uh, come from the east. One of them sounded like they were coming towards us, and then it just veered off behind us. We never saw it. We heard it really loudly, um, and while we realized, okay, that that plane is not going to come find us. The second time, again, we heard a plane. We ran up the hill, and it went up. It was up another drainage, you know, just in front of us. Um, so we were sort of in the center. There was one behind us and one in front of us that went up two different drainages. But, but uh, we were sort of just in this little void. You know, the planes were out there and they were looking for us, but they were just missing them. In those times, that's where we got, you know, at least I felt myself morale at least go way down, get real frustrated and actually real angry. You know, just at the whole situation, angry, just at the situation in general, just because of the sheer frustration. We were real disappointed about that, but we were still real hopeful until, uh, until it started to become dusk that evening. I felt like we were very vulnerable here. A cold front or a storm coming down uh, could, could literally uh, kill us quite easily. And so when we weren't going to be located that second night, I became very concerned. Well, why aren't they, why aren't they here? Why aren't they up the NOAA attack? We figured, you know, if the search planes are going to come out, they're going to go straight up the NOAA attack. Well, how could they go wrong? There's something wrong. What's going on? Didn't they, you know, why aren't they here? We hear them off in the distance, but why aren't they here? And so it was kind of like the morale that we picked up all night by being so sure. It's like, okay, okay, all we got to do is make it through the night and they'll get us in the morning. And so it was kind of like a, a big letdown, disappointment. The airplanes that were out there weren't seeming to find them right away. And so I got kind of concerned that it might be uh, more serious than, than our initial thoughts. Since I had flown for the Park Service before and knew the area pretty well, I thought maybe I could be of some assistance. I knew the flight plan. I talked to Warren, and I knew the flight plan, and I knew the mission they were on because I'd done it myself. I knew they were doing a hunter survey. And as we proceeded up the middle no attack, why I, I noticed uh, a party of hunters and uh, decided that they might be of some have some information. So I landed on a gravel bar and talked to them, and yeah, they. They described the airplane approximately when it passed over. They even noticed there was three people in it. So uh, I thought, well, this, this is working out. I'll just, and they told me which direction they were going, what the wind, what the weather was, and so on. So I figured, well, maybe, maybe the hunters are the best source of information. So I started up the river, and I stopped and talked to a total of six different hunting parties. And every one of them got me closer and closer to, to in the right direction. And as I approached Mock Pick Creek, uh, I don't know why I, why I went up to check that lake up on the bluff. I didn't think they'd be there because there's no hunters up there, but I thought, well, what the hell, I'm here, I'll, I'll swing by there. We're just sitting around the fire, and then all of a sudden... Uh, Out of nowhere, we heard the plane. We heard a, a Super Cub uh, coming low from the west, and uh, I'd given everybody the, the, the flares, uh, aerial flares and uh, both Stan and I shot flares at the airplane. We ran up and we're waving and, and making all kinds of commotion and shooting the flare off. And when I swung by I found uh, the floats of the 185 inverted in the lake. And we flew along the south shore of the, of the lake and didn't see any, any survivors, didn't see any bodies. So we were concerned that they were still in the, in the airplane and at that time Patty and Stan came out of the willows where they'd been, where they'd been trying to stay warm. Of course, we felt pretty good about that. Yeah, well, first of all, seeing the plane, that's what really picked us up because we were just, we knew where we were at and we knew that, I'm sorry, we knew the park service knew where we were at. We knew that we could be located. 
we could see from passing over them that they had no survival gear at all, that all they had was the clothes they were wearing. So I, and I knew they had swum from, swam from shore, so I knew they must have been uh, pretty miserable. So we tossed out every bit of survival gear we had in the airplane, and uh, Victor threw out his coveralls. He was a lifesaver mm -hmm. for that. And they told us then that uh, the helicopter was coming in. And, but we didn't take anything for granted. Even though the two planes came in, they said the helicopter was coming in. And then uh, finally the helicopter came in. And even at that point, when me and Bruce left the fire pit down, we still never put the fire out. We still never took anything for granted. It was kind of like our, like our trust was, you know, our trust was shaken that day. And, you know, we didn't trust anything. We didn't trust that the helicopter would run out of gas or wreck or whatever so you know we just realized it was very important we were taking no chances at that point. Uh, we, we stayed with our gear until the um, EMT, the two EMT guys came in and um, we, were, we were hauling all of our gear into the helicopter and got taken, all that taken care of and got into the helicopter and then they started checking us out. And then when we got to Cotsview, everyone was there waiting for us. I'm glad to say that it worked out the way it did. I, I, I was uh, overjoyed, elated when I saw uh, that the three of them were, uh, were all right. Yes.